My name is Ben, and this is a lecture on scaling and estimation for Data 601 at UMBC. Uh, so this is the title slide, um, which is a bit of a joke. Uh, it's got two jokes on it. The first joke is that it's a picture of a forest, and the forest has one tree that is much, much taller than all the others. And so sort of the takeaway from that picture is like if you were to look at the average height of the trees, you have some outlier, which might disrupt your ability to estimate what the average height is. Uh, and then the second joke is sort of the, the caption down at the bottom here that says, nine out of 10 data scientists agree, you need more than 10 samples, which the comedy there is that you surveyed 10 data scientists to get that result. Okay, so for our schedule for the rest of the semester, we have this plus two more lectures coming up and then the final project presentations uh, in May. So there's just a few opportunities left um, to ask questions and have me sort of investigate what's going on with your Python script. So get your questions in while the semester is still going on. All right, so Estimation turns out to be uh, something that you get to do all the time if you know how to do it and when to do it. Um, it's very useful throughout data science and in the rest of um, sort of your life, but typically people don't worry about estimation because they can get by without it. Um, but the ability to sort of forecast the future and predict what's going to happen relies a lot on estimation. So we'll cover a couple different applications within data science uh, as to how that applies. All right, so the first thing to sort of like get out of your mind or place into it is the idea of um, how precise does an estimate have to be? So basically you're trying to predict the future and if you're trying to be really precise, you'll probably be wrong. And so the, the goal is not to be um, very specific with your answer, but to be more, get the general answer correct. So that's the concept of accuracy. So an accuracy uh, that is high with the trade-off and maybe less precision is very useful for uh, predictions. The other sort of takeaway uh, is to document the way in which you came about to an answer. So um, if you're sort of just guessing, then you should say that. If it's uh, sort of uh, not based on any evidence, then you should say that. But if you're estimation is based on a set of facts that you can quantify, then that really differentiates it from a guess. All right, we're gonna give you a, a few sort of things to think about when estimating and then give you an example of an estimation. So the way that I try to start out with is to sort of encapsulate the problem as a story. And from that story, I can figure out what variables are present in the story and it would need to be part of a model of how I'm quantifying the, the outcome. And so once I've identified the story and the variables that are in that story, then I can start thinking about what units each of the variables has. So like um, if I'm looking at the, the number of revolutions of a tire, maybe the, you know, the length of the circumference matters, right? Or um, the speed at which you're driving determines the amount of time, right? So there's lots of different units to think about um, in terms of each variable. And you'll want to be sort of capturing and documenting what those uh, decisions are about what variables are present, what units those have. And then once you've got the variables and units identified, then you can start um, making educated guesses at what the relevant values would be. And these are not, you know, is it 56 or 57, which is like a very standard question, uh, it's a question of more like what order of magnitude is it? So is it 1, 10, or 100? And usually you can use your background and some context to figure out what the relevant order of magnitude is, even if you don't know uh, a more precise numeric value. And then you can sort of make a, another numeric guess about what the, uh, the, what the accuracy of that number is, whether it's very close to what you think it should be, like, am I 10 years old or 100 years old? Okay, well, neither of those are quite accurate, so maybe we can say that we're probably off by at least, you know, a factor of 3x or 4x by that. So you can say, put a bound on how reasonable the guess is. And in all of this process, you'll want to be writing down what your, what your uh, 
what choices you faced and what decisions that um, sort of you, or what conclusions you made off those choices. Uh, and as you've maybe already started hearing me vocalize as I'm exploiting local knowledge, like I know when, how big of a, how big is a tire? Well, I've seen tires before and they're much smaller than 10 feet in diameter, right? And so like you can sort of guess the circumference, maybe it would have to be less than 10 feet and like, so uh, even if you don't know the actual number, you can exploit your life experience in coming up with a reasonable number. Another sort of like tripping hazard that people encounter is that when they do know the answer, like there are 52 weeks in a year, it turns out that often that might not be that uh, important, especially if other things are off by a factor of 5x or 10x, right? And so rounding becomes important to do the math quickly. Uh, and so you can maybe replace 52 weeks with just 50 weeks, uh, which is easier to do multiplication with. And then lastly, sort of once you've got a number, um, you know, <laughs> validating that that number actually makes sense, again, against what the context is, is a good check on your estimation. All right, so normally if we were holding class, I would um, give you the option to vote on which uh, of these stories you're interested in hearing. So um, I'll make a choice uh, with my four-sided coin and I'll say, I'm gonna go with number two. How long would it take to count to a million? Okay, so how am I gonna solve this problem? I, get, I don't have time to count to a million, so I, I wanna make an estimate about how long that would take. Okay, so sort of the, I'll start counting, right? And then once I start counting, I'll time how long that takes, and then I'll sort of extrapolate from there. So that, that's my story, and, then, and the things that I, the variable there is the count, it doesn't have units, um, but the timing is what matters, and so I actually need to time that, and maybe I'll time it in seconds, right? So let's try this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, and that took about 10 seconds. So counting to a million, you know, maybe it takes a million seconds, but then you realize, wait, wait a minute. Actually, I can't just multiply the counting one to 10 because there are numbers that are much larger, right? So maybe there are numbers like 100,024, right? So that's a big number. More uh, even something that would take even longer to say is something like 124,563, right? Now that's a longer number and so it takes longer. So we realized that, that actually the larger numbers are gonna take longer to say. And so therefore maybe what I really needed to do is time myself counting these large numbers. Now obviously saying the number 124 versus 124,563, those are um, you know all different scales. So how could I, again, I get back to this problem of I don't have time to count all those numbers, but if we think of the fact that there's gonna be roughly, uh, let's see, so six digits, the most numbers that we count when we count to a million will have six digits in them. And so most of my time is actually gonna be spent counting six digit numbers so really, maybe if I uh, if I estimate how long it takes to count 10 six-digit numbers, then I could say that most of the numbers that I'll be counting on the way to a million are six digits long. And so maybe that's a more accurate representation. So let's say 124,000, uh, let me get my stopwatch here before I start counting. All right, so I'm just gonna start my stopwatch, I'm gonna count Five, I'm gonna count 10 uh, six digit numbers. 124,563, 124,564, 124,565, 124,566, 100,000, or 124,565, 124,566, 124,567, 124,000, 128,569, Okay, so let's say that took 45 seconds to get through 10 numbers that were six digits long. So then we'd have to do the math to figure out how long is 40 seconds times, what is that, 100,000, right? So 
four hundred thousand so let's see 40 40 seconds times a hundred thousand numbers is that that's it a million numbers right so a million times 40 seconds so that number of seconds divided by 60 would be the number of minutes it would take okay so I took a little bit of sampling there I took some data I timed it I realized that I had a mistake and I went off and I tried to figure out a better estimation right and so this process sort of like iterative improvement towards an actual solution is is uh, very common with estimation like you'll make a bad decision first, and then they come to a better decision. Okay, so another sort of uh, fun question that I won't go into is like, how many balloons would it take to cover the grounds of UMBC? So this is, uh, again, just a thought experiment of like, how would you answer this question? So it's something you might wanna like, take a break in the video here and actually write down, what are the relevant variables to go into that? What are the units of those variables? What sort of estimations would you make for the numerical values? How far off are you on those? And so forth. So I'd recommend uh, taking that example and trying it out for yourself to see what you come up with an answer for. Okay, so last comment here is that none of this is specific to data science. We'll come back to the data science uh, application in a moment. All right, so Often someone will come to you because you're now a data scientist and you're the numbers person and they know, you know hypothetically more math than the other people in your office. And so they're gonna to come to you with questions about like how much resources does this team need like in terms of computation or storage right, uh, or budget. And so those are in business pretty important numbers to, to work with. And so that's where the application of sort of these skills are gonna be useful. Um, so you get asked these sorts of questions all the time, even though it is not your expertise nor role, right? So you, you may not be in charge of managing a team and you may not be responsible for the allocation of a budget, but you'll probably be asked about how much time does something take? How long does, you know, should we wait for these people to do the task? Um, how long does it, does the computer take to do the analysis? Uh, and, and how much storage do we, are we gonna need? These are like constant questions we get from management because they're trying to develop business plans and business plans benefit from being able to predict the future. So this whole skill of estimation comes back to um, you know, making a plan for a business and, and, and sort of informing decisions. Okay, so hypothetically, when you start out in this job, you won't have much exposure to uh, what the historical sort of outcomes have been, but the more sort of ways you have of measuring the things that are under uh, analysis and the, and the number of sort of historical examples you can provide, that'll improve your accuracy. Right, so, uh, and sort of this estimation skill comes down to having exposure to data um, and so that gets into a skill of sort of how do we measure all these different aspects? And so we'll actually co we'll cover the topic of profiling in the next lecture. Um, so profiling helps you understand like how much time something takes. And we've already seen a little bit of it in class. And also uh, in an upcoming uh, example notebook, we'll look at uh, capturing the amount of storage something takes. So these are uh, profiling methods that you can use to improve the accuracy of your estimation. So one trick that I've sort of learned over the years is that when someone asks you um, how much something costs, a sort of question you can shoot back to them is, uh, is it really about the absolute cost or is it about the relative cost? So what I mean by that is, um, you know, a business wants to take uh, an action and do something. Usually it's not, should we spend this money? It's, which of these options should we spend this money on? And so it might be easier to do a comparison between different options without potentially actually knowing the actual cost of everything um, and just say what the differential is. So if, if you can sort of get away with that, the differential or relative cost is often easier to determine than the absolute cost. Okay, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about why scaling matters in the next section. 
So if you haven't seen this chart, it's uh, from IBM. It's the sort of description of big data. So this is, you could say, potentially what kicked off uh, data science so was sort of as a hot topic was this scary sort of infographic that was designed, you know, by IBM to sell more IBM uh, you know, products. So sort of be a little bit cautious about who's selling you this idea and why they're selling it to you. But I actually do think that there's uh, a relevant concept to big data. And to me, the, the, the evidence that I've seen in my experience of talking to data scientists is that big data is just more than what you're used to. And so that's all based on what you have experience with, right? So like if you have uh, an Excel spreadsheet and you've been working with that for years, then something that doesn't fit in an Excel spreadsheet is big data, right? And if you've had a data center full of computers, you know, running for many years, then something that doesn't fit in your data center is big data. So just to sort of put some numbers on that. So like if we say like a page of data, right? Like you might hand to an office worker and say like, hey, what, is this, what does this contain? And they'll read it. That one page of data might be a hundred lines of text. And so if, if you give them more documents than they can read in, in a reasonable time, then that would be big data. Another transition is like if you're working with spreadsheets and you have something that fits in a spreadsheet or maybe multiple uh, worksheets, that might be sort of where the person is comfortable operating, thousands of lines of data, right? Something more, more than you'd want to work with on paper. But then if you said, you know, here's a gigabyte of data, um, typically the person who's used to working in Excel doesn't know how to handle that. And so again, um, once you've gone to the sort of gigabyte to terabyte scale, that's where a lot of people sort of have skills as far as data scientists working with, you know, one computer and one hard drive worth of data. That's a lot of data, right? Let's, let's be <laughs> frank about it. It does a lot of ones and zeros. But then maybe you've been on a computer that has many hard drives, right? So maybe 10 or 20 hard drives in one computer. And this is maybe now a, a, a reasonable server that has terabytes of data on it. And now you have to worry about like, Oh, did my analytic cross those drive boundaries? Like that's going to cause things to be really slow, right? So again, this is a skill set that if you're comfortable operating there, um, it's just a sort of transition um, point. And the next one I would say is sort of when you have a collection of computers now running as a cluster or in a data center, that is its own scale. And so each of these has an associated skill set um, and, and transitioning from uh, any one of these to the next larger one is in some sense getting big data. Okay, so I've used some abbreviations there that like TB and GB that you may have seen elsewhere, hopefully. Um, these are basically just ways of indicating the numbers of ones and zeros. So think of a, a megabyte, right, as like a, a standard CD has something like 600 megabytes of storage capacity, right, and a DVD might have 4.7 gigabytes. And so doing these translations between gigabytes and megabytes, right? That's like a factor of a thousand. And then, so again, it's useful to have in your head some sort of concept of what these different sizes sort of relate to. So when someone says, I have a gigabyte of pictures, you know what that means, right? So you should be able to say, oh, a gigabyte, that's like hundreds of pictures. Um, and so then you can think, okay, what's the largest capacity that would be reasonable for storage? Okay, like 40 petabytes, right? That's like a supercomputer back in 2013. Uh, so having these different sort of markers of how big something is, is useful because your daily experience of like how big is a house, how big is a car, right, that informs estimations about um, real life sort of applications. But if, if you're worried about data science, um, storage sort of frames of reference might be useful to sort of know how big something is. So if someone asks you for, you know, does this laptop have a petabyte of storage? You'd be like, no, it's not a supercomputer. All right, so <laughs> this is a sort of natural uh, sort of inclination of most people think that scaling works linearly, right? If I have um, something that's getting bigger and costing more, it's just going to scale linearly along this line here. Uh, and I'm here to tell you that that is not how scaling works. Um, by the way, a little joke here, there are two kinds of data scientists. 
those who can extrapolate from incomplete data. All right, so I'm going to tell you that the uh, extrapolation method of sort of getting bigger doesn't work out well. There are hardware reasons for that, right? Your computer is built with a monitor and some keyboard, but also some compute, like a, a CPU and some memory and storage, right? And so each of those hardware components is not sort of continuous, right? It's, it's a it's a discrete variable which which has a certain number of um, processor cores available, or um, you know number of gigabytes of RAM available. So that's not going to be sort of continuous. It's going to be incremental. And so the consequence of that is that um, when you think you're going to sort of transition to the next thing, you sort of have to think about what change of hardware is that going to incur, and what are the consequences of that. So for example, sometimes when you double the amount of data that you have on your computer, then your computer doesn't care because you're still within sort of like the capacity of that existing hardware. But other times, if you have like uh, some larger amount of data and you double that, then you're constrained by the hardware as to um, what your actions are. So like, um, doubling doesn't always have the same consequence. Here there was no change in hardware and here there was. So just to visualize what that looks like, it means that when you're scaling up, you can't linearly extrapolate because hardware forces you into these step functions, right? So you can't sort of buy an arbitrary number of gigabytes of um, memory and you can't buy an arbitrary amount of storage and you can't buy an arbitrary number of uh, processors. And this will show up in your in your homework assignment when I tell you to look for something and it turns out that no hardware vendor sells that. Right? And so then you have to sort of figure out, well, what would be a thing that satisfies this and maybe is too big, but is the smallest thing I can find that sort of satisfies the requirements. So this is what makes estimation hard, is that you in computers you can't just linearly scale the requirements. Okay, so um, this shows up in other places too. So for an example, um, even when your computer has a sufficient amount of storage, the way in which you access it um, changes. So I'll give you a specific example of that. So if I'm m manipulating a data frame in Python that's only 10 by 10, like it has 10 rows and 10 columns, then all of that um, data will be stored very close to the processor. It will be stored in uh, the memory of the computer. But if I have, say, a million by a million size data frame with a million rows and a million columns, then I can't fit all of that in my memory. And so therefore, that some of that data frame will have to be occasionally stored on my, com on my computer's disk. And so the consequences, the I.O. performance, right, the, the ability to get the data in and out of memory changes depending on whether it's in RAM or whether it's on disk. So the bigger, so when I, here's the point, right? When I have some amount of data and I want to know what is the performance of being able to manipulate that data, it changes depending on the size of the data because of the hardware. Uh, again, same thing for processing cores and memory. So like if I have two cores on my computer and I want to go twice as fast, can I even buy four cores, right? Um, can I access all those with my computer? Right. So takeaway point so far we've gotten is that scaling is not continuous, it's discrete, it has these little steps that you have to worry about, and it makes hard estimation. Okay, so because, of, <laughs> because we're operating on hardware that's in reality, then we have to figure out um, when to switch uh, certain choices that we've made in software. And so what I mean by that is um, you may want to switch the algorithm you're using based on the hardware you have, or you may want to change the language you're using or the data format. So when we uh, have hardware-induced choices, these are the sort of other things that we get to tune to deal with those constraints. All right, so we've talked a lot about big data. Um, now let's look at some other consequences of it. So I'm going to talk about some real life examples, and then we'll talk about a Python example. So we've talked about scaling up 
um, data, but we haven't sort of also worried about the what you find, right? So like, yes, you have more data, but now what are you gonna do with it? So just to give a, a quick example of the Rhine paradox, um, this comes out of a, some research in psychology to the ability to um, make predictions. So very relevant to us here. Let's see if we can get out of the browser and switch over to a Wikipedia page. All right, so there's a guy, Joseph Rhine, who runs some psychology experiments. And so he's wondering, do people have the ability to predict the future? Like, are they uh, able to guess what cards he's holding in his hands? So he does these experiments on a bunch of people, and he finds that some of the people are, in fact, able to predict which cards he's holding in his hand. And so that means that uh, that gives evidence that they are able to predict the future, right? So that's cool. So now he's he found evidence that people can predict the future. So, you know, in the true heart, of, you know, <laughs> effort of science, he goes back later and and retests these same people to figure out whether or not they had, um, you know, a persistent ability to predict the future. And he finds that of the people who previously had the ability to predict the future, none of them retained this capability. And so that's that's really disappointing, right? And so this this whole idea of extrasensory perception, um, sort of like he can't repeat the experiment, and it's it's super frustrating. So you know what happened there, right? How did he find people who were able to predict the future? It turns out that if you um, flip a coin, right, a large number of times, then some of those instances you'll find all heads. So finding a coin with all heads doesn't mean that the coin was biased, it just maybe means that you flipped the coin a lot of times. And so he sort of ran into the same problem of you're showing people cards and having them guess what you're holding, and then, so just if you run the test a large enough number of times, some of the people will accidentally or randomly guess correctly. So that doesn't mean that they actually knew what you're holding, it just means that you ran the test a bunch of times. And you'd say, okay, well, obvious, this, this principle is so obvious, why would I need to worry about it? Well, <laughs> they ran into the same problem in 2002 for the federal government when um, the president's effort to find all the terrorists back in 2002, right? So this is after September 11th, 2001. You want to find all the terrorists, and you say, write me a computer program that finds terrorists, right? So they go off and write these computer programs, and it finds a whole bunch of people, right? hundreds of thousands of people who are identified as terrorists. Now, how, how did that happen, right? It happens because you're looking for um, these really rare events, but in a really large data set. And the consequence is you'll find something even if there's nothing there. And maybe there was some terrorists in that data set, but you wouldn't be able to distinguish it because the people you're looking for were so rare that you couldn't distinguish it from the false positives. Okay, so basically this is the problem of when you scale up, you're going to encounter problems that didn't previously exist in your data set. So I'm going to give you a quick um, Python notebook of what that looks like uh, and sort of like how to deal with it. So we've got this problem of we've scaled up our data and now we're looking for rare events. So let's do a Python notebook to sort of explore that concept. All right, so I'm gonna um, write some code here, and this code is sort of boring, right? And you'll be like, why are we doing this, right? So <laughs> I'm, I, I really like license plates, right? So license plates, in my world, they're gonna be composed entirely of uppercase uh, letters. And so what I wanna do is figure out, um, I'm looking for un license plates with unusual strings, right? So I wanna find people who have uh, license plates that are weird, right? Like that have all A's in them or all B's, right? So that'd be a weird license plate, right? Um, so I'm gonna generate a large data set. I'm gonna have license plates that have 10 letters in them. And you have to think about the fact that if I have license plates that have 10 randomly selected letters, what that really means is I have 26 choices for the first letter, 26 letters for the second letter, another 26 choices for the third letter, and so forth, right? So for 10 letters, 
I have 26 choices and 26 choices and 26 choices. So these ands are uh, multiplication. So I really have 26 times, uh, 26 10 times. And so what that works out to be is a very large number. Right? So how big is that number? The first three digits are 100, then 1,000, then a million, and a billion, and a trillion. So that's 141 trillion different license plates right, that I could get if I select 10 letters at random from these 26 with replacement. All right, so that's a large number of license plates. So let's write a, a license plate generator, right? So this is basically, I'm gonna start my stopwatch. I'm gonna have this list here to record uh, the string that I generate. And then I'm gonna loop over, so I'm gonna have 10 digits, so it's gonna range uh, 10 here, it's gonna go through zero through nine. And that uh, digit index variable doesn't actually get used, because what I'm really gonna do is I'm just gonna uh, randomly choose from that ASCII string uppercase, right? so that was that set of numeric, uh, alphabetic letters there. I'm gonna choose from that, I'm gonna get back a character, and I'm gonna append that character to my string. All right, so if I run this uh, very quickly, I get back uh, a random license plate for my vehicle, and it has this string. Right, so I, I took all those letters, I joined them into a list with no separation, and that took very little time. Okay, a little side tangent here. I'm going to go on on uh, list comprehension. So I could rewrite this list, right? This uh, this for loop here, because what I want to get back is a list. So anytime that I have a for loop from which I want to get a list, I could use a list comprehension. So where that's gonna uh, work for us is I'm gonna have a list comprehension that is real simple. It takes the letter A and produces that for every iteration in this range three. So not quite what we had above, but sort of similar as you can sort of see, in one line, I produce a list, that's square brackets, of A's for every sort of loop digit index in a range three. So it's going for digit index equals zero, print this. For digit equals one, print another A. For digit equals two, print another A. So that's how we get our list of three A's. Since that isn't quite what we had before, uh, let's do something slightly different. I'm gonna have uh, for every element in the range N, I'm gonna print a random uh, choice from that ASCII string. So here, this presents something, uh, a list that's slightly more similar to what we had up and above in that for loop. And you'll notice this weird thing of I have an unnamed variable here, so this is the underscore. We didn't actually assign, we didn't use this anywhere, and so we can just leave it as an undefined variable, or unnamed variable. And so lastly, I'll reconstruct the list that I had before, uh, and so now I got another string that was randomly selected from that list of 10 values, uh, and it ran uh, in 0 0.00035 seconds. So that's pretty fast. You'll notice it's slightly faster than what we had up here by a factor of 10. So this for loop, this for loop um, runs 10 times slower than this, uh, this list comprehension. Most of the time I don't use list comprehensions because they're uh, hard to read and hard to comprehend, but Sometimes if speed matters, this might be relevant. Okay, so we've got our string uh, generated. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether you use a for loop or a list component in this case. And next I'm gonna uh, make a, uh, a function that finds matches. All right, so I'm gonna start with this uh, function, just walk through what it does here. See, I'll put some line breaks in so you can see what it says. Uh, so I'm going to have a function called one match. I'm going to put in a string and then I'm going to generate some number of random strings to find this string in. Um, and those uh, string length will be what we used before, 10. And then I'm either going to print a result or not. Okay, so basically I'm taking uh, that string comprehension that we had up above and I'm going to ask if I run that multiple times and I'm looking for uh, some match in that randomly generated string, do I find it or not? Okay, so let's 
just oops, I forgot to run the function. So if I run uh, a, uh, this function for 10 loops, and each loop is going to produce a randomly generated string of length n, here n is 10, I'm going to look for the string a. So what it prints in this case is all the all of the randomly generated strings that contain an a. Right? So that's what the if the letter a is in my license plate that it was generated here, I'm going to increment. Okay, so here's in my ten light randomly generated strings, I found three cases that had an a. So that's cool. Um, is that unusual? We don't know yet, right? So we have to do some math to figure out, is this an expected result? Would I, If I ran 10 different randomly generated strings of length 10 each, would I expect to find three of those strings with an A? All right, so let's do some math. So I know that for the first uh, character in my license plate, the probability of getting an A is 1 in 26. And the probability independently of getting an A in the second position is 1 in 26. And I can sort of repeat that for all 10 characters. So I could have basically this the statement here is I could have an A in the first position, or I could have an A in the second position, or I could have a second uh, an A in the third position. So the pluses here are for an or. So I could it could be the case that I have a success given that A is in the first position or the second position or the third position. So that's why I'm using the pluses here. So let's see what the probability of finding an A in any one of those positions is. It turns out the probability is 38%. Okay, so now we have some confidence that the likelihood of finding an A in 10 license plates uh, with uh, you know strings of length 10 on average was 40 percent and we got back when we ran it we got three results back so that's pretty consistent that's close to what we'd expect for that so the, you know going back to the question of we didn't quite have big data here yet but we can make a prediction about how likely it is that we'd find this result and in fact if we run this again and we do it again and again we'll keep getting roughly on average, three results. You know, forty percent. I mean, four results. Okay, so that is um, sort of the the math that we're going to do. And we're now we've built up to the concept of let's find more and more unusual things, right? And so, the, the probability of finding an A A A is less likely than finding the probability of an A. In my random, uh, in my string of ten digits, and the reason it's less, it's less because I need to find them adjacent, right? I need to find a and a and a in those three positions. So the probability of that is pretty small, right? So it's uh, 0. 0.00005, which is 0. 0.05 percent, I believe. Okay, that's the probability of finding an a triple a sequence. Uh, but what I really care about is I don't care about where that position shows up. And so it could show up that the first three characters are AAA or the second, uh, third, and fourth characters are AAA, right? And so like because I don't care about where that AAA shows up in my 10 digits, then I have to say the probability is I want to find AAA in the first position or this position, right? Or, and so I've got this combination of ands and ors, right? The, amp the multiplications and additions. So even though the probability of finding uh, an A in these three in three characters is low, what I really care about is the probability of finding an, a triple A anywhere in the um, sequence of 10 characters, and so that's actually a little higher. Okay, so we found the probability of finding a triple A sequence in 10 characters. So let's do some um, simulation and figure out whether that holds up. So I'm going to run a whole bunch of simulations, uh, 10,000, and I'm going to look for 
uh, on average, if I if I see something like four and a half of those ten thousand tests results in finding a triple A, then I'll know you know that it's it's just random noise. So even though it's an unusual sequence and I'm looking through a really big data set, I expect to get back some random data. So this is sort of the point of the exercise is that if we have large data, we're more likely to find unusual results. And so uh, here we, we ran that same function of one match again. We're looking for this unusual sequence, AAA, but because we ran a whole bunch of tests, we found that there were three results that showed up. And I do this multiple times. I get on average four and a half um, license plates, you know, to have this match. Okay, so the the way that we can sort of uh, account for this is that if we find something and we know uh, what the random result is, then we can normalize by that. And then account for you know how far is how far is what we found different from random, All right? So if you found uh, something with a highly unusual sequence, you have to have some idea of uh, what the random result would be. Okay. So another concept, uh, sort of the second half of the notebook in sort of conceptual sense, is that if we're looking for multiple different uh, results from a test then we have to account for the fact that we're really running multiple experiments on the same data. So what we just found here in this test is that there are on average four and a half matches. And so I'm gonna write a slightly different function and we'll see what this does in a moment. So I'm, the function two matches looks for either the strings triple A or triple B in my sequence and finds those results. Right? So it found nine matches here. And so you think, wow, in 10,000 10, tests, right, that was the number here that we supplied earlier, we found a whole bunch of sort of unusual behavior, right? Triple A's and triple B's. But if you go back and you think about why did we find more results? It's because we ran more tests. Okay, so if you look at what is the average there? So again, I ran nine tests there are nine, I got nine results back, but that is uh, very consistent, which is uh, we ran, we were expecting back four and a half uh, results for each test. So that's the, the game there. So why, why would anyone sort of be conf you know, surprised by this? The, the reason it's important is because when you're working with big data, like literally you know, very expensive data, it was you know, a lot of effort to collect, a lot of sort of storage investment was made. A lot of, you know, we had to hire these expensive data scientists. So the businesses are gonna be expecting more results out of this larger investment. And so you're gonna have more questions asked about the data. And so you'll run into sort of instances of like, you know, I'm looking for more unusual things uh, from that large data set. And so I wanna get back more results that are of value. But again, it's important to figure out, was, he, was this just because we ran so many different tests that we got so many different results back? So we've got the bond Ferry's principle. That was what we've just reviewed. All right, and so we've basically summarized that uh, not only are the scaling issues gonna be not linearly scaling, they're not continuous, uh, they'll also have new problems that we didn't foresee at smaller scale. All right, so a lot of that was sort of the technical quantitative aspects. Now we're going to do uh, some more soft skills. So this is one of my favorite games, right? Like, <laughs> yes, you need to have the Python skills, but it's also important to have a social network. So this is a lesson that I learned pretty early on in my career. Um, you know, I am a good data scientist. I can code well. Therefore, I'm just going to do the work and I'll be sort of 
self-sufficient. That is a totally reasonable attitude to take, um, but I've seen it to be a little bit limiting in the sense of if you can tell other people to do something and they do it for you, that saves you work. Right? But usually we're not in a position to do that. And so um, if you can rely on other people um, to do something for you without tasking them, without telling them to do something, that's an even better skill. And maybe you even gain insight when someone asks you a question or thinks about a problem in a way that you didn't expect. So again, even if you don't get work out of them, just the stimulus of asking them questions and getting insights and sharing uh, sort of ideas is useful. So working with others sort of is a skill. Um, so the way that I have figured out for myself how to do that is that I will figure out what I'm not good at and then I'll figure out what I am good at. And I'll find other people and try to identify what it is that they're good at and what they're not good at. And often there'll be sort of a mismatch. You know, we both, we both um, may be interested in something and one of us is good at it and the other is not. And when you can identify that difference, that is useful. Okay, so normally if we're in class, I would do this following activity. Um, you would write down what your personal um, weaknesses are. What are you not good at? All right, so you'd write down three of those things. And I'll give you some examples here. This isn't exhaustive, and I wouldn't be collecting anything. But the point of the exercise is that you should know what you're not good at. And you can also write down what you are good at. What are you skilled at? What do you have experience with? Right. And then um, what you would do is you'd talk to other people who have those six things written down on their paper. And for each of your weaknesses, find someone who's good at that thing. And, and then similarly, uh, you may find someone who is good at something that you're not good at. And so this is how you sort of build up value in a relation with other data scientists. It's by figuring out what they're good at and what you're not good at. So we won't do that because this is a video. <laughs> but I do get complaints uh, when we do that, that, you know, <laughs> we won't have exercises run by Ben to go off and, you know, find weaknesses and strengths. <laughs> and I totally agree with you, right? Like, it would be cool for me to, like, come to your workplace and run this game, but it's probably not going to happen. So instead, what we have are sort of conferences, professional organizations, meetup events, right? And these are, again, they're not direct games by Ben, and so you'll have to figure out how to do this your, on yourself, right? With, with other people in sort of like a not too stilted manner. Of, you know, if you ask someone, could you please tell me what your three weaknesses are? They're probably not going to answer it, right? And if you said to someone, hey, I have three strengths, and they'd be like, uh, okay, bye. <laughs> right, so it sort of like takes, it takes, its, uh, there's another skill of sort of conveying to someone what you're good at and figuring out what they're not good at, that is itself a skill. But it's totally worth doing to, with other data scientists because when you find someone that's good at something or find someone that needs help, that's value. All right, so basically this whole thing is about creating leverage. Leverage is a good thing. All right, so <laughs> we spent a little bit of time on soft skills. Now we'll talk about data formats, right? So another sort of uh, <laughs> technical skill that we care about. So again, uh, when you're looking for, for working with big data, you can work with fake data. Um, so, you know, if someone says, hey, I'm going to show up with a little bit of Excel spreadsheet, and you'd say, yeah, but what happens if we had a terabyte of this, right? or a gigabyte? Um, you can create that, that scale of data as needed. Uh, typically, someone's going to show up with small data, you know, in, in our in the way that we work with it, it'll, we'll be very comfortable with it. Um, but it's worth sort of thinking ahead, you know, estimating how long is it going to take if we had a gigabyte of data, and how how much compute resources would this consume if we had a terabyte? Right? And so um, we have to figure out uh, what to do with that data when it gets bigger. All right, so. There's uh, one way of sort of 
tackling this is sort of as an entry point, is think about the data format. So historically, we've been working with CSVs, and CSVs are not very uh, small, right? We'll say like they don't compress the data, uh, and so therefore they can get pretty big. So a quick way of dealing with large data is to compress it. So a couple of examples of what that looks like is SQL Lite, all right? So this is a relational database that Python has a library for and you can connect with. Um, then you'd be reading it off disk. Another is uh, pickle, which is a serialization method for variables, um, and you can then write those variables to disk using Python. A third option, which is sort of less common, but again, potentially useful for big data, is HDF5. So HDF5 is uh, a way of handling complex data structures that are usually organized as tables, um, but often multiple tables. Uh, so just like SQLite, you can have multiple tables in a database. You can have that same thing in HDF5, but you get the uh, extra structure of having basically folders um, associated with it and metadata. So metadata is a, a concept that you have maybe the data frame but the data frame itself just has rows and columns. It doesn't tell you who authored it or when it was authored or how the data was collected. And so sometimes the metadata, although usually much smaller than the data, is as important as the table itself. So you want to find a way of storing the data about the data. So HDF5 offers that. Um, so the other cool use case for why one would use HDF5 is that you can um, make changes to the data without reading it all into memory. So normally the way that we use uh, pandas is we have some data on disk, so we have like a CSV file, and then we read it in using pandas into memory, and then all of the data is stored in memory, at which point we can then make changes to it, and then when we're done making changes, we would write all those changes back to disk. In comparison, HDF5 uh, lets you make changes to data on the disk without having to read it in memory. And what that allows you to do is to uh, work with data that is much larger than could fit in your memory. Okay, so that's probably about all I'll say on HDF5. Other than this next demo, it's not really useful in this class, but it's just something to be aware of that it exists and is available when you run into that scale of problem. Okay, so let's get out of this. All right, so this notebook, I'm just gonna walk through a couple uh, examples of using SQL and Pickle and HDF5. We won't use them extensively in 601, um, and so the point of this is just to be aware that they exist. Okay, so I'll run through this. I'm going to install tables for HDF5 access, and then I'm going to import all these libraries. So I'm going to get H5PY, so there's a Python library that interacts with HDF5 data. I'm going to use pandas and numpy to create my data, and then I'll store my data uh, with a library called SQLite3 and pickle. Okay, so let's create some fake data, right? That's where we start out with. So I'm going to have a thousand rows. I'm going to take um, numpy's random int, and I'm going to say uh, create numbers between zero and a thousand, uh, and I'm going to give it dimensions of what is that? A million by four, right? So it's a, a a data frame that's pretty large, has four columns and some data there. Let's just type df numeric shape. Okay, so that's our data frame of numeric data. And then just a little tip that I learned while I was working on this is that you can actually add to a data frame attributes. So like I was mentioning before, that metadata of data about your data, here I can say that the author name um, for that data frame was Ben. So that's kind of cool. Okay, now let's also create another data frame 
this data frame is going to contain text. So the data frame is going to have, um, let's see, so it's going to have, it's going to use the faker to create these 10 columns of data. So I'm going to have uh, some text, basically, and then it's going to uh, use this loop index here. Uh, and for each iteration of the loop, it's going to create this dictionary. And then it's going to put each dictionary from the loop into a list. And that list there is then going to be converted into a Python data frame. And that takes about 20 seconds for 8,500 rows. Okay, so that is the data frame there. So it's got all this data, um, and then we're going to use those numeric and text data frames to store to disk. Yeah, we should say how big this is. Okay, so I'm going to take uh, HDF5, the data format that allows you to store multiple data frames and metadata all in one file. And we're just going to write um, the data frame to a file. So I'm taking my numeric data frame. I'm going to use the to HDF uh, command. I'm going to send it to this file handle. And so the, the file handle there is H, which is corresponding to my file. Once I've written that to disk, I'm going to ask how big is that? So that file that we wrote with a million by four size data frame is 38 megabytes on disk. So the command here I'm using is OS path get size. So I'm asking for this file, how big is it in bytes? And then because I don't care about how many bytes it is, I'm going to divide it by kilobytes and then get it into megabytes. So this is my conversion to mega, megabytes. And I'm going to uh, keep only the first two digits after the uh, radix for that. So it's 38 megabytes in size. The reading in command is pretty straightforward. I'm going to read in from file. And then uh, the, the variable that I had before doesn't exist, so I've converted this to raw. So that attribute disappeared because it didn't get saved. Oops, there we go. Oops, not that. Okay, so we've got the HDF5, and we can store the same uh, thing with the numeric, and we've done that. So basically, we just walked through how to use HDF5. You'll never see it again. And then for comparison, I'll actually see one more. I'm going to dump all of my uh, numeric data frames to CSV, and then we'll ask how big is that. So when we save it as a CSV, it's actually smaller. It's more concise to say uh, here are just all the numeric values on disk. Okay, SQLite. I think we've seen before when we're looking at the histogram of browser history. Uh, so I'm going to connect to an SQLite database. I'm going to place a cursor at the top of the sort of like command queue. And I'm going to dump my numeric data frame to that file. And then when I do that, I get back that it, the file is now 73 megabytes. That's pretty large. And then the last method that we'll use is the Python Pickle, uh, this is a serialization library. So we're just dumping that data frame, and it's a 30 megabyte uh, file. Okay, so that's just to say these are all different methods with different trade offs about storing data. And the last little section here I'll just show you quickly is how to save multiple variables to a single file. So you can do that uh, with HDF5 here. And then I'll also show uh, that you can do it with um, pickles. So you can save multiple variables to a single file. And then you can read them back in. Actually, so I should show that this ran. And then I can get back the data frames from that Python pickle. So you can store multiple variables to a single file. 
that's all I wanted to show you, just to show that these things exist. They give you different options for storing data. All right, so the, another sort of option besides this data format is the data representation. Again, I'm not gonna spend too much time other than to call to show out that it exists. Basically, when you have a very large table of values, um, then you have you know, the number of rows times the number of columns, let me fix that, number of columns uh, in your data frame. And that might be a lot. And so one thing that you uh, often encounter in these really large data frames is that there are a lot of empty elements. Right? So an example of that is if I have 100 documents and the corpus has a vocabulary of 20,000 words, then that's a table with 2 million elements. And so typically there'll be a lot of missing entries. And so you can save on storage by not storing all those empty references. So there's a whole bunch of different methods of saving tables. So like if you think of a CSV, every row and column is represented and that's wasteful. And so there are different representations, ways of storing the matrix. And the best approach really depends on a couple different factors. Um, so you could store, um, say like three columns of the row, the column and the value. Right? So that would just give you uh, a, a new table with three columns and potentially only as many uh, rows as you have values. So that might be easy to store, right? So that'd be a coordinate list. But then the problem is uh, you, and, and it takes up less space, which is a good thing, but it might not be tuned for the algorithm that you're gonna use to analyze the data. And so in all these problems, you have to think about not only the storage mechanism and the, and the capacity of your storage, but also the way in which you're gonna access that data. So if you're gonna do like say, you know, an operation on every third element uh, in the first row, then looking up what that value is in this sort of method of laying out the data might be uh, inconvenient. And so that's why there are different methods of storing these sparse uh, tables because it depends on what the way in which you're going to access the data is. Okay, so we've basically <laughs> introduced this trade-off that we can say um, how we're going to lay out our data and store the data impacts the speed at which we can do our analysis. So this trade-off means you now as a data scientist have choices to make. So. Once you have trade-offs and you wanna analyze what the different options are, you're gonna be measuring performance. So again, going back to where we started with the estimation process, estimation is really based on knowing what the reasonable values are. So the a convenient way of getting what is a reasonable value is to measure it, right? And then you actually know this is what a reasonable value is. So I'm gonna walk through a notebook where we uh, build an experiment and then walk uh, and sort of if I can get to the notebook we'll measure what the different scaling is mm -hmm. all right so I'm gonna take basically a very silly function and I'm gonna um, <laughs> apply that to a data frame and I'm gonna vary how big the data frame is and measure that and so this is basically setting up an experiment to measure a thing that I care about. The thing that I care about in this notebook is not the actual uh, analytic, but it's the infrastructure for doing the experiment. Okay, so I'm gonna import a few libraries here, and then I'm gonna show you the outcome. So I'm gonna jump straight to the outcome. So here we have this function, it takes a row and it doubles the column A. So this is that silly function that I warned you about that it doesn't actually mean anything, it's just giving us something to look at. So don't worry too much about this function. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take this function and we're gonna apply it to a data frame and then we'll see how long that takes. And we're gonna do this five times, right? So we'll measure 
how long did it take to apply to the data frame? How long did it take to the data frame? Right? And do that five times. And then we're going to change the size of the data frame to be larger. And you'd expect that as the data frame grows larger, this operation takes longer. Right? And so that sort of estimation question is, how long will it take as we get larger? So we're going to run this five times for each of these three sizes. That's 15 different sort of trials to run. So as I warned you, I'm going to do the entire experiment all at once. So this is a, a big old section of code here that I'm going to skip over and come back to later. So I did my uh, five trials uh, of size data frame size 100, and I took uh, 20, 0.22 seconds. And when I ran those five different trials for a data frame with 10,000 rows, it took almost 14 seconds. There we go. It took 20 seconds, right? So we've got back our, our 100,000 uh, size data frame, five trials in 10 seconds. And when we run that, uh, we get back, I, I've, I've produced a data frame, uh, uh, sorry, a dictionary called serial results. And the serial results say that the time on app of those five trials on average was 0 0.02 seconds. So let's plot that and we get back this, um, this uh, picture of how many rows there were. So this is our uh, input variable and our output variable was time that it took. So for a very small data frame, it took very little time and for larger data frames, it took longer. So that's a good thing, right? The other thing to note here is that I've only done three trials and they happen to fit with a line. And I warned earlier in the lecture that it's highly unusual for scaling to sort of scale linear, or for, for larger things to scale linearly. Um, but here we do see that. And the reason is because we haven't exceeded the memory capacity of my computer. So I was able to do this entire experiment uh, in my computer's memory, which means we were within one of those steps and it didn't sort of change the performance. So we didn't get a step function here. Okay, so I, I, I warned you that I was gonna skip over this huge block of code and I'll show you how I got there, but we'll do it very slowly. So the first thing is I'm using time.time. .time. All that returns is the number of seconds since 1970. And you're like, why do we care about that? Well, it's because we can different we can take the difference between the time since 1970 and then, then wait a few seconds and then ask that same question and subtract those two and get the elapsed time. So that's what I've been using throughout the 601, time that time. Okay, the next step uh, is to uh, build some fake data. So as I've mentioned before, I'm using NumPy's random integer, and it's going to get back a value between 0 and 1,000. What I really want is a table of fake data. Um, and so my table of fake data, I'm going to pass it a couple entries of the range of values that I'm willing to accept for each entry, and then how big I want that table to be. So in this case, I want a table of size 4 columns and 10 rows. It's practically a data frame, and turns out if we shove it into a pandas data frame, Pandas recognizes it and says, here's your data frame. So I've got that generated. Again, to reiterate, all this is building towards how do we time a function and how do we uh, measure that as, a as, a, as it scales up. So I want to be able to generate data that is larger and larger and then take time how long it takes to apply some function. In this case, again, I just have a function that I want to apply called double column A. That is my function. And the way that I apply it to a function is I can use this data frame dot apply. Right? So df is my data frame. I'm going to apply this function to each row. And I'm going to get back the results and place them in a new column called K. So that uh, data frame I can apply. Uh, oops, I shouldn't run this. Right, so I've got my data frame, and I can apply a function to it. 
And when I get back is a new data frame now with five values in it. And so I want to know, you know, it's fast, but how is how does it scale? Right? That's the question. So I'm going to reset the data frame back to four columns, and I'm going to measure how long it takes to apply my function once. So here, if I say, uh, you know, start my stopwatch, and then run the analysis, and then stop the stopwatch, and count how long it took. Okay, so here I got one numeric value back because I ran the experiment once. So if I want to run the experiment multiple times, I can put it inside this for loop. And so I'm just going to have five tests. I'm going to loop over each of those tests, and it's going to give me back five results. Now the problem here is your computer is pretty smart. And your computer recognizes that the data frame is the same every time. And so you'll notice that after a little while, the, the computer started sort of recognizing, oh, that's the same data frame that I saw before. I'll just keep it in memory closer and so that I don't have to regenerate it. And so um, it's important when you're running tests to reset the sort of initial data so that it's an actual different test. Otherwise, it'll get faster over time unexpectedly. Right? That's not what we want. And so here what I'm doing is I'm, again, looping over the five tests that I'm making but um, I'm, I'm trying to reset the data frame, then run my experiment. Uh, I'm unfortunately getting shorter times here still, but that's probably a different issue. So I'm doing my experiment inside the for loop, and I'm also setting up the data frame inside the for loop. Okay, so now I've got back five numeric values. I don't actually care what those numeric values are, because what I really care about is the average. So I'm going to take the the list of times and store them into a list and then I want to know the average and so I'll just take that list and I'll sum all the right I'll sum all the numeric values here divide by the number of tests and then each entry each five tests gets me back one numeric value that's the average time it takes uh, for each experiment okay so now I've got basically this is my one for loop to loop over the test, and now I want to have um, I'm gonna, the next for loop that I'll write is to loop over all. The, so this is just including the averaging, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to have another loop that iterates over the sizes of the data frame. So now we're instead of we're going to print out this is the data frame or this is the time it took on average over five tests. Now we can loop over two things, right, the size of the rows and which test index. So this is like test 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And so here I'm going to store those results to a, a, a dictionary. So the dictionary is showing us that, uh, you know, a data frame of size 100 took 0 0.02 seconds on average, or average over five tests. When I have a data frame with 1,000 rows, then on average over five tests it's going to point, take 0 0.2 seconds. And so we can see that linear scaling already, right? We can see this is 0 0.2, I'm sorry, 0 0.02, 0 0.2, and 2. So each of the factors of 10 increase corresponds to another order of magnitude improvement in, uh, increase in the amount of time it takes. So if we plot that, right, we're just going to plot the, the, the keys as our x-axis and the values as our y-axis, and that'll get us this plot. So that plot um, shows the scaling for three different sort of sizes. And then we can add uh, this linear fit to that, and now it looks pretty. Right, we've got a labeled axis, the number of inputs that we have, and the number and the outputs here is the time. Okay, so if I wanted to put that, so remember I started out here with a, a dictionary of keys and values, but maybe what I really care about is a table, right? Because a, a, a picture is nice, but you know, for later reference, I want to have it into a data frame. So what I would do with uh, this this uh, dictionary is, you know, I'd just try and put it into a data frame, and you know, potentially that works, but it's not really a tidy data frame in the sense of 
these column headers are not correct and these times they're all in the same row so that's not that's not what we wanted so let's see if we can get it into something that's more useful so one problem that I see here is that the 100 and 1000 and 10,000 those aren't you know really descriptive as column headers so probably what we really want is something where we can say something like size is a hundred and time is something in seconds right and so the way that I'll start out is I have this dictionary of key value pairs. I'm just going to loop over each of the key value pairs in my dictionary and print out sort of the thing that I think I want. So here I have a, a for loop. I'm looping over these results and I'm saying for each of these key value pairs, just print out something that's slightly different. So I'm going to print size 100 time, you know, whatever it is. And so that's that's a more accurate representation of what I probably care about. But this print statement isn't going to be the solution. I actually need to save that dictionary as a dictionary. And so this is a modified version of what I ran up above. So here you'll notice that these are print statements, but it's not actually a dictionary. It's just a print statement that looks like a dictionary. Here, this is an actual printout of a dictionary. And you can see the difference this has actual like quote marks, right, and the spacing is correct. So this is better, but it's not quite the thing that I need because this is a dictionary per iteration in my loop, and I really want a list of dictionaries more like that. Right? So this is I've taken my my list here, and I'm going to store each of the entries in that. So now I have a list of dictionaries. And then that's something that pandas does recognize. I can just throw that into that list of dictionaries into a data frame, and that is what I wanted. And so notice the big difference here. Each variable is a column. Each row is an entry. So that's, that's a good indicator that I have a reasonable data frame. Now, it's not perfect because it's missing something, right? And so sort of bonus question if you want to answer at home. What is it that you would do to this data frame to make it more descriptive? So one recommendation that I would make is that size as 100, like I don't know what size is. What I really probably mean is like number of rows, right? So I could relabel this as number of rows and then this time Actually, it should be time in seconds, right? Because it's more descriptive with units. Okay, back to the lecture. Okay, so we, we built an experiment, basically a sequence of some, some code structure that allows us to time how long some, something takes. So let's use that, right? So I'm going to... Um, I mentioned earlier that it might be relevant to change um, algorithms sometimes. Uh, and so uh, I need a way of comparing the usefulness of different algorithms. So let's say I've, I've, I'm going to give you, again, this is just a toy example of I have a list of values and I want to figure out what is the index of the value 2, right? So I'm searching for the number 2 and then the thing I want to get back is the index. and so. You know, a very um, simple algorithm is just for each element in that list, that, is it equal to 2? If it's yes, then return the index, right? So that's like an example of an algorithm for a search in a list. And so if you're a computer scientist, <laughs> the game to play is sort of counting how many steps there are in a given algorithm. And the algorithm with the fewest steps is supposedly the fastest, and so therefore you know, the most important. And so, again, if you want to estimate how long something is going to take, you can turn to a computer scientist and ask how efficient is your algorithm. And then they'll go away and give you an answer that doesn't make any sense. So the um, estimation of time for an algorithm relies on this big O notation. So it's sort of a way of giving examples of the worst case for an outcome for an algorithm. So search is a really common sort of task, and so there's different algorithms that one can use for it. And then these different algorithms are have different levels of efficiency. So we'll see what that looks like in a moment. 
Um, and the big O notation, if you hear about it, it's just a way of counting the different scaling for the number of steps that something takes. Okay, so the relevance of this is somewhat limited because most of the time you're um, working sort of at the small enough scale that efficiency isn't super important, right? Whether something takes 10 seconds or 12 seconds, you probably don't care, right? Where this starts to matter is down here at this range where you, you know, we're operating on something that size that takes up an entire data center and it would take three weeks to run versus 10 years to run. And that's sort of like the scale at which these different curves matter. If you're operating with small data, it's typically not relevant. Okay, so I'll give you an example uh, at very, very small scale of differentiating different uh, algorithms and their implementations. All right, so I'm not going to run this notebook live because it takes a long time to run, but we're going to import our libraries. And then, as I warned you, I have a very simple algorithm that I want to run. I have this search of a list that I'm going to do. So first I generate a random list. And then I say, I'm going to look for one of the elements from this list. So I'm going to look for the element 21. I'm going to ask where in this list is the element 21. So in this current example, it'd be the answer is zero. The index of 21 is zero. And that's what we find. So when we, Python has this handy feature where if you give it a list, and you ask what's the index of this value, and it prints it. So that's pretty handy. Okay, so the source code is linked uh, if you wanna look at what that algorithm looks like. So again, I warned you that I have a very dumb algorithm. The algorithm basically loops through each of the elements of the list, and then says um, if the entry is equal to the value, then return that uh, index. So I can ask, you know, let's pick from our random list the third element, which is in this case 24. So I'm going to pick an element from that list and ask what, and I'm going to use my dumb algorithm, I'm going to ask uh, from that list, where is the element 24? And it's going to return back the value 3, because it happens to be the third index. The location is in the third position. So I found a couple different implementations of the search algorithm. Um, so I stole these from Rosetta code. If you're not familiar with the Rosetta code, check it out because it's totally awesome. I'm gonna actually go off and uh, look at it right now. So I'm gonna looking at Rosetta code for a, a specific algorithm uh, for called binary search, which is what we're working on today. And it gives uh, sort of like an description of the, the algorithm, what it does. And then it gives you different implementations in a whole bunch of languages. So if you're ever wondering like how to translate between different languages, Rosetta code is an awesome place to look. So it's got implementations for this one algorithm in all these different languages. So that's how I found, I scrolled my way on down to Python. I don't know if I can find it again. All right, so I looked in the Python section, and here's an implementation of the search algorithm. So that's cool, right? But, and it has all these other languages implementations right next to it. So basic, prolog, what else, PowerShell, right? So all of these are the same algorithm with different implementations. I know, that's just, I find that awesome. So I stole this code from uh, Rosetta code and basically implements the same concept of, I want to find a value, uh, and then, oops, I forgot to run the code. Uh, yeah, I have to run the random list. Okay. So again, if I, if I pass in the random list three, then it finds the value th uh, three as, as the location. So this is implementing the same search feature as our sort of naive implementation, and it's the same as what Python's implementation is, sort of con conceptually. 
And then I found a fourth one, which is even more complicated. So uh, all these different methods to do the same thing. And you're asking, what is the value of this? Like, why do I care, right? I'm trying to do data science. Well, the purpose is different algorithms are going to operate on the same data at different amounts of time. And more importantly, they're going to scale differently. So as you search more and more data, then the algorithm which you're using may become more important. Again, at small scale, it almost never matters. Okay, so again, now that we've got the reason that we're doing this, let's look at different scales, right? So I'm gonna look at uh, a list, and the list is initially of size 10,000. I'm gonna run uh, the timing test three times for that scale. So I'm gonna run a search for in 10,000 elements three times. I'm gonna do that again for uh, 100,000, and then what is that a million and a hundred million? So larger and larger list to figure out how long does it take? And this is that same structure that I had set up in the previous notebook, right? Outlining that I have to loop over the different list lengths. I'm going to loop over the different tests, and then I'm going to run, um, you know, a new sort of list creation, and I'm going to run the four algorithms against it. So in this case. I have four different algorithms, and all I'm really caring about is the amount of time that that took to run. So I'm not even saving the output. And then I'm gonna do, after each of these sort of three, uh, exam three sort of searches run, I'm gonna store all the results into a dictionary for the average time. And what I get back is, on average, um, the elapsed time is for a hundred for a list of a hundred thousand elements, 0.38 seconds. So that's pretty short. But you see here for a hundred million, it takes almost five minutes. So five minutes is a long time to wait for a search. Okay, so let's make a plot, a picture, right? And so here I'm just taking all of those four different algorithms, and for the uh, different sizes that I ran, I'm I'm showing how uh, large uh, the time it is. All right, so here's my my input is how big of a list that I provided, and then the output is the amount of time that it took to run the algorithm in seconds. So my sort of like very dumb algorithm, which are called sequential, that is the algorithm that takes the longest, right? So down here for a very small list of say, up, up to a million elements in the list, it's almost indistinguishable. But then when we go to 10 million, it's much, much slower. So that's that's bad, right? We had to search through every element of the list um, until we found a match. So that takes a really long time. Now the the Python default method takes uh, on average half that for a list of 10 million elements. But the other two algorithms that we found on Resident Code are really fast, right? They're like indistinguishably fast from zero. And so those are really crazy fast. But there's probably a good reason, which I don't know the answer to, which is why did the Python developers choose a slower method of search? Right? And so like this is sort of a reasonable question to ask is, if there are known algorithms that are faster, they must have been evaluating some other trade-off other than speed to figure out um, what, the, what the value of this algorithm is. So they chose a slower algorithm for their implementation. And you can sort of like drill down and sort of like zoom in on, you know, are those are those two that we looked at uh, from Rosetta Code, are they even distinguishable? And uh, I couldn't find a large enough list that would show them to be different. So that's sort of like a practical example of choosing different algorithms that scale differently, right? So like here, this is that curve that uh, sort of talking about big O notation. It's it's much worse than the native Python algorithm, which is slower than two other algorithms that I was able to find online. All right. So because you're working at small scale, the right answer is almost always to use brute force. Just do it the dumbest way possible to get it done. If you find later, that your naive approach was really slow and that you do need the speed, then you can go back and revise. But my, my advice out of all this sort of like scaling talk is to start with the dumbest thing first. 
The most important thing is to get it to work. Once you've shown that it works but is slow, then you can make the choice that I should invest more time in optimizing, finding a better algorithm, finding more hardware, right? doing other things that are fancier, but almost always the first answer is you do it the dumbest way first. Okay, so that's my, my takeaway is start small, start simple. All right, so you wanna start with data that you can handle and that you can think about. Um, and then when you do to move to a larger sort of data analysis, go back and make sure your code works, right? There's nothing worse than like running a huge program against a lot of data that you've never run before and it breaks, but only five days into the calculation, right? So that's super annoying. So it's always good to start out with some sample data and run it and make sure your algorithm works before running it against the big data. Okay, homework time. What does all this leave us with? Not surprisingly, some scaling experiments, right? So we're gonna work with some, uh, some data that has 10 columns of data and we're gonna have uh, a variable number of rows. Now, I've, I've, in an earlier notebook in this lecture here, I showed you how to measure the file size on disk. So I'd like to see um, your measurement of that using Python. And I want to generate some fake data that is of increasing size. So uh, 0.1 megabytes all the way up to 500 megabytes. You can generate fake data of that size. Um, so the, the question of generating that data, that I've time capped, right? So that should take less than five minutes. That'll probably force you into uh, doing some, some optimization tricks, but you'll find that out when you get there. Okay, once you've generated this fake data, it's in memory. So the task is to take that fake data in memory and write it to disk as a CSV. Once you've got your data as a CSV on disk, you can time how long that operation took and then repeat that for other files, right? So I wanna say, I wrote this file to disk, it took this long, and I repeat that experiment. And then once the data is on disk, load it back from disk back into Python. Right? So I wanna put it from a CSV into a data frame. How long does that take? Right? And measure that. And then what I wanna see is a table of the timing, so file size versus the read write times, and also uh, a plot of what this looks like. So one plot with all those numeric values in it. That's the first homework. That, that's, it's reasonably difficult, so I would recommend not waiting until the last moment, but it's something that you can do, and you can certainly ask me for, for help and tips. Um, when you get stuck and you and you like, You've done it the right way, but it's taking too long. Definitely email me for some hints. Okay, so as usual, I always recommend starting on paper. So you should write down in your own words what the objective is and how what steps you're gonna take and knowing what outcome you want, right? So the table and the visualization in this case. And then write down the, the sort of recipe of steps you're going to take, again, on paper, before you write code, write down what it is you're gonna do and then once you've got your recipe worked out, then you can start writing code. Okay, there's a second homework assignment. The second homework assignment is to do some cost scaling analysis. So I'm gonna give you uh, a specific problem and then you're gonna tell me what is the money that I would need to spend for storage and compute and moving data. So we're gonna talk about Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. So specifically, I want you to tell me how much does it cost to store one terabyte for one year and how much does it cost to store 100 terabytes of data for one year? On the compute side, I'm looking for a computer that has 20 cores and one terabyte of RAM and five GPUs. So that's a computer with 20 cores one terabyte of RAM, five GPUs. And lastly, for the cloud folks, I want you to get data from your computer into the Amazon cloud, and I want you to get it out of the Amazon cloud. So that's uploading a 10 terabyte of data up to Amazon, and then from Amazon, downloading a 10 terabytes of data. 
Same thing for Microsoft. They have Azure Cloud. You'll get 10 terabytes into the Azure Cloud and get 10 terabytes out of the Azure Cloud. And then lastly, for Google Compute Services. Okay, so there's lots of providers, lots of places to start. There are some links. Uh, there's a fourth task. Um, the fourth task is uh, that a fourth, no, a fourth of you will be getting is you're going to be getting hardware. So I don't want you to get cloud. I actually want you to buy a computer, right? And don't actually buy the computer. I just want you to get the cost for the computer. But again, I want you to get one computer that has 20 cores, 10 terabytes of RAM, or sorry, one terabyte of RAM and 10 terabytes of storage. So you can find prices for this on sites like Newegg.com and other ones. Okay, so I'm not having you do all the work. I'm going to divide you into four groups. So people who have a birthday in January or February or March, you're working on self-hosted. So that's this problem. Right? You're going to answer that problem. If your birthday was in April or May or June, then you're going to work on this problem for Microsoft. And if you're born in, uh, in July or August or September, you'll work on Amazon. And for the last three months, you'll work on Google. So basically, I'm going to give you a table like this in Blackboard, and then you're going to fill that out. And I want you to say what the cost was, right? like uh, as reported by the vendors. Where did you get that from? Not just the domain name, but the full path, like where the data comes from, and like any constraints or notes that you have on that. I think, yeah. So th this is a, a specific layout. I'll give you the Excel spreadsheet. It's in Blackboard, but you're only going to do it for one vendor. So you'll either do it for Amazon or Microsoft or Google or for the actual physical computer. Okay. And at the end of the class here, I'm really curious. So I'd like you to send me an email with one thing you have learned and one question you have. So again, please email me this. I'm curious to see whether I'm providing any value to you. So let me know in an email what you learned and one question. Okay. Thanks for watching.